Okay, thank you, Samaya. Uh, good morning, everybody. So uh, the project that uh, this uh, talk is, is, is about comes from an answer Master of Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada project under the same title, Robust Crowd Sensing for Intelligent Road Services. So this has been ongoing now for two and a half years. We are in the last six months of this project. And we have done uh, uh, some work uh, along different uh, directions, one of which is this uh, road information services direction. The previous paper I was introducing about the uses of vehicles is also part of this project. So uh, the first thing is, is to realize that vehicles uh, are not only used for transportation or moving from A to B, but also they have uh, a multiplicity of sensors. Uh, these sensors can certainly be, be put to good use. Uh, vehicles have sensors like uh, visual sensors, uh, proximity sensors, uh, from radar to, to uh, even LIDAR sensors in some vehicles. Uh, there are also uh, sensors connected to the onboard diagnostic unit of a vehicle, and all of these are possible to use. And if we can tap into the uh, OBD on onboard diagnostic unit, which is standard in so many vehicles, then we can make, uh, we can have access to a wealth of information from these sensors. Uh, some of these sensors include, of course, uh, information about velocity, about acceleration, about rotation, about, about angles, and stuff like that that is actually readily available for us to use. Uh, and, and I'll come to that also in, in, uh, in, in a minute as well. But not only that, we can use vehicles for other things as well, including for computation or for storage, as I was indicating in my previous talk today, that uh, these can be used for that purpose. They can be also used to inform about the conditions of drivers and sometimes the distress levels, especially if we have an emergency situation and things like that. And they can also main directly connect to uh, uh, first responders, or it can be used for entertainment and inf infotainment and all types of services that are available to us. So that's, that's the, the pr premise of the future vehicle. Uh, so the goals of the, 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 the project that we are um, uh, in is that we want to uh, not only get information about uh, other services around us, but also information about the driver. And you know that lots of insurance companies now uh, are offering these dongles that you can hook, in, hook to your OBD and then it can monitor your driver profile and you can get lower insurance based on that. We also want to monitor road, road conditions and classify the conditions or the roads depending on that. We want to do validation between different vehicles and want to make sure that the vehicles uh, provide us with accurate information and the information is also georeferenced as well. And we want to offer uh, adaptive route selection based on uh, preferences and also on road conditions and driver profiles and driver skills as well. Okay, so we know that if I have a smart vehicle, like the ones that are being proposed now for the future, and more and more now we are seeing these vehicles with lots and lots of extra sensors that can be used then we can collect all of this information, but we don't have smart vehicles right now. So the first concept that I would like to emphasize is that we can use uh, phones, mobile phones or smartphones uh, to what we call smarten up these vehicles. So we integrate smartphones with a classic uh, existing vehicle through tapping to its OBD, and the OBD is standard since the mid-90s, and now we are under OBD2, and of course we are going to move forward with that, and lots of information is there. So we can smarten these vehicles by tying them to the phone that you are using, and everybody has a phone, and everybody can use that phone. Now, we have these in-vehicle, uh, 
sensors that we can gather information from. And also, if we have the smartphone and the existing vehicle, we can also have uh, multi-sensor fusion happening between the two and coordination that takes place actually in our case, in our project, takes place at the mobile phone itself. So we take the readings from the car, the reading from the mobile phone, we fuse them together and then we have a more accurate reading. So with these accurate reading, we can then do some feature extraction. Whether the features are about a driver, the features is about the road condition, or weather conditions, or whatever we want. And these features will then give us road information and a driver profile. And from the road information and the driver profile, what we can do, of course, after we go and send these to a cloud, we can do cross-referencing. So some of these functionalities uh, then, or some of this information, sorry, can be sent to a road information service that is owned by the city or the municipality, the, 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 the province or whatever, and some of it can be actually used for the well-known, uh, for instance, Google Maps. You can send, you can have this as a pre-processing step for Google Maps, so it helps in the suggestions of routes when Google gives you these routes to use. So some of these, uh, and of course then this comes back to you as a choice. So some of these functionalities are done in a vehicle, some of them are done in a roadside unit or what we call a fog uh, uh, computing uh, uh, space, and some of them can be done in the cloud. Okay, so the point at, at, at the end is that, or that we want to use a vehicle with, its smart, with a smartphone integrated together to do that. Because we don't have access to the smart vehicles uh, that provide everything now, or they are very expensive, we can use this option here, uh, and that's what we have used throughout the project. So let's talk about road anomalies. Uh, everything has a motivation, and the motivation for going for these road anomalies and detecting them is that they contribute significantly to accidents and failures and damage to vehicles and so on. And we have done, there's lots of studies that have been done in the UK, some studies have been done in Canada, lots of anomalies have been done before. In fact, there is a famous uh, case where the mayor of Montreal about 10 years ago was offering a reward for those who actually can find a pothole that would, would, would fit a rubber chicken of some dimensions, okay? And this, was, this is a true story. So now we come to that, that we are depending on the people, on crowd sensing. And we are doing the same thing here, except that crowd sensing is going to be done by devices. So. Uh, there's lots of information here. This information may look very awkward, but let's say in the whole of Edmonton, there was that many road anomalies in 2016. In Toronto downtown core, that, that was that many. And in, in Ottawa downtown core, that was that many anomalies that have been detected. This is in 2016. Okay, so the first part is that we want to, through our vehicle, with the onboard diagnostic unit and the sensors that are connected to it, and a smart device, we want to collect information. This information could be acceleration, rotation, yaw, pitch, whatever we want to collect. Then we want to denoise these so that we only keep the information that is going to show distinct behavior. And then we want to extract some features to know this is a pothole, this is a rail railway crossing, this is a manhole, whatever it is. And then we send this to a database. This database could sit at a roadside unit or later go to a cloud, whatever it is. But we also want to do georeferencing such that it is accurate. And georeferencing is also a very important function because accuracy in uh, navigation systems is much needed, and if you are driving in downtown Chicago here or downtown Toronto, in our case, uh, the satellite feed gets lost a lot, and you actually can't find your way. 
So being able to georeference this location accurately is a very important feature that we want to do as well. And at the end, we want to take these readings, put them in a database for what? For future drivers that are going to pass by the same roads in the future. So we begin by data collection. And to collect data, we have to find a car. So we have to find a, a, a nice graduate student who has a car that we don't care about. And we put, we retrofit this car with so many things, including uh, uh, GPS devices and, and I, mean, I mean, all of these things here. And we have a couple of smartphones that we are testing with, with, with both as well. And we have a, 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 a very accurate uh, positioning system just for referencing. And then we have a crossbow IMU system, which is very cheap. Uh, this is the one that we are proposing to be used and, and enhanced and so on. And we retrofit all of this here, and then we go on the road and then to see uh, these anomalies. And actually, uh, the, the reason I said we don't care about this car, because we are going to ask this particular person to actually go in the problem areas and then feel the dip every now and then, OK? The car survived, by the way. So what are the type of anomalies we are looking for? The type of anomalies we're looking for, like, uh, for instance, could be something that can be done on one side of a vehicle or done on both sides of a vehicle. Uh, for instance, here, if we have a pothole or a manhole, this is a one-sided type of anomaly. And it has certain, uh, uh, let's say, characteristics in the signal that comes out in the three-dimensional space. Uh, these are the ones here. Or it could be something uh, that is uh, uh, on uh, double-sided, like railway crossing or, or a pump uh, I mean, along the, or one of these humps, man-made humps along the road and things like that. And again, each one of these has its characteristic that we are saying that this is the characteristics of railway crossing or, or whatever. And again, along the three axes here. So once we have that, uh, if you notice that the signal has lots of noise involved, so the first thing that we want to do is to denoise these signals. And luckily, there is even a package uh, on MATLAB that uses uh, uh, Wavelet uh, um, packet uh, for denoising, and we can just feed into this MATLAB module. And then at the end, a signal that looks like that will be more denoised like that. And it's obvious that this is where the area we are interested in, whereas here there was lots of noise. Uh, uh, that we do want to get rid of. So after you do this denoising, then you have to do feature extraction. And the feature extraction, in this case, you want to, you want to know what this event is. So depending on the specific signal that it, it comes out, you have a vector that associates this with a particular uh, signal or a particular feed that comes. Uh, uh, there. So we say uh, this would be, for instance, the acceleration. This would be, uh, uh, let's say, the time it takes and, and, and things like that. So this would be the attributes that you put together. And from these attributes, you can say, OK, I'm going to call this a railway crossing. I'm going to call this a I'm driving on a mild road, for instance. OK? Or I'm driving in, in, in snowy road or whatever. So you have different classification there. So these are the types of things that we went, either I'm driving on my, my load, I have a pothole, I have a severe, severe pothole. And severe potholes, like, like in any place in, in North America, these exist. And especially at the end of the winter, you find many and many of these. And by the beginning of uh, the fall, many of these are fixed, but many are not. And they become bigger and bigger every year afterwards. Uh, and then you have manholes, and, and in many, many cases, when they are fixing the roads, you just leave this high or leave it low, and, and you don't know what they are doing. So, or there is a crack, there is, there is a dent in the road, uh, there are speed humps or railway crossing or whatever. So we train this on the information that, that we have, and we, we say, OK, here is inform information. We, we train the system on these, and then we have a vector representing this information. And then it is trained and ready for test. And when we did the testing, this is the success rate that we have. So after we did the training on a certain roads, we go on other roads for the testing. And then this is the success rate we have. And it's, it's, in some cases, it's quite close. 
like, for instance, when you have a, a, a mild pothole or a severe pothole. And sometimes uh, it's not as accurate. For instance, there was 80% somewhere. somewhere. Uh, let's say uh, uh, if you have these stripes on the road sometimes. Uh, so um, it, may be, it may confuse it with something else. So we do, of course, the true positives and the true negatives and the precision and recall and stuff like that. And at the end, we get that this is the uh, classification. So we use that now. This is something we use. We decided that this is the event. But where this, this event is, we have to do georeferencing. And again, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, we depend for location on uh, GPS. GPS, in its normal usage, has an error of about uh, 10 to 20 meters, 30 meters sometimes. So usually it is combined with an INS, inertia-based system, where you use both pieces of information to get more accurate results. Now, if the GPS is out, then your, your location gets you, you, you lose track of your location, and you don't know where you are, and so on. And this is where the INS can help a little bit. So we are going to use the GPS information along with uh, the, the, the INS. And also, we are going to use the smart devices sensor. So this is the addition we did here uh, to, for more accuracy as well, not only depending on the car's GPS. Uh, what we have used for INS is a cheap crossbow uh, uh, IMU uh, device, which just is going to just use inertia to decide, here's, this is where you were, this is where you're going to be, and so on. Uh, in a typical scenario, when you have the actual uh, uh, INS system, uh, as time elapses, the INS system just has lots and lots of uh, 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 deviation from the actual road. Of course, when you use GPS, also you have to use mapping to actual road traffic and so on, so you know that this is road, this is not road, and this is used for correction as well. So with a GPS, you have errors as well, but it's better than just depending on IS. When you use them together, then you can actually have more accurate uh, readings. If the GPS is, is uh, 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 challenged or doesn't exist, then what happens is you don't have the GPS reading. Then you start your INS system from a more accurate position here throughout the GPS outage. The GPS, the GPS outage usually happens in downtown areas or in tunnels or whatever. So after the GPS comes back, then you can go back and then have a more accurate results. And the reason is we want to say that this pothole that we have detected is at this place. Uh, I want to say something else as well, that we are also experimented with a system where you don't depend only on the actual sensors for the pothole or for the cross railway crossing or, or whatever, but also on reporting by uh, the actual user. But of course, this requires that another person is, is, is there and reporting, and this is not usually the case. So it's not, it's not as seamless as when you just depend on the sensors. So we have tested that. Uh, this is, uh, for those who know uh, uh, Kingston, this is typically a, a typical place in Kingston here. And we just uh, went from one place to another. And because Kingston does not have any place which is GPS deprived, uh, we do simulations by just turning off the GPS receiver. And there are several places where we turn off this GPS receiver and only depend on the IMU to see what the results are. And during the GPS outages, we see how much we deviated. And we can see that using uh, both systems together, you can actually you, the, the maintain some uh, accuracy during uh, GPS outages. OK, so uh, that was the first part. So now we have the events on the road. We know where they happened. I still have the georeferencing. This is something that I'm still going to use. But now I turn all. What else can I do? I can also do driver profiling. To do driver profiling, we did uh, two separate studies. One is an offline study. We did a study of, we got 
uh, uh, data set, and we do a study on a driver profiling for X number of users for crash and near crash situations. Because if you do real testing, you cannot wait for a crash. Oh, we crashed. Oh, this is why we crashed. Uh, we can't do that, right? So we had to depend on um, information that has been collected by a third party for that purpose. Once you train on crash and rear crash, then you can have your driver, and then you can actually decide what the action of this driver, not again, not in a crash or near crash situations, but just what is the profile of that particular driver. So what do we get? Again, we get the same information, whether it is where we, how close we are, what is the side, uh, uh, side movement or the vertical mo uh, or horizontal movement, what is the yaw, uh, w w the, 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 uh, around the rotation around the vertical axis, and what's the speed, and so on. So we use all of these here. And we also take into consideration, and that also comes with the data set that we have, have been using, uh, road conditions, traffic flows, uh, traffic density, uh, 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 weather, uh, 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 and whether there was road alignment or, or not, what is the lighting that was present and the case, and so on. So all of these are input to in, in, in the data set. So what do we do uh, in this case? So as I say here, traffic flow, density, weather, and so on. And what, what we do is so to, to, to we identify the maneuvers done, and we classify people as, I mean, there was initial classification as aggressive, non-aggressive, but also there was a classification of skilled, because sometimes there are people who do aggressive moves, but they don't go into accident because they are very skilled. And there are people who are, are very con conservative in their driving, and then they run into accident because of skilled people who confuse them. So that also could be the case. Uh, so again, we said about uh, uh, road conditions. These are the things that I was mentioning before. Uh, traffic flow, whether we have uh, divided or undivided or no lanes whatsoever. Traffic density, whether it is uh, stable, heavy, or, unsta or, or just goes up and down and things like that. The weather, foggy, snowy, rainy, and so on. And the lighting, whether it is uh, very early in the morning, uh, at night. This is my worst driving condition. I mean, I don't like to drive in, these, in this here. I, I'm okay with dark, I'm okay with daylight, that's me. Other people are fine with dusk and, and, and dawn and so on. So with that, we take, we, 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 take the, we take the information in, and then we can see how this driver behaved in, again, crash or near crash situations. So we look, for instance, at acceleration, we look at lateral movement, we look at uh, range with the, with, the, with the car ahead of them, and for instance, we can then classify this as tailgating. Okay, uh, there are more attributes that I'm just skipping. And then we can classify this as aggressive lane change. You change your lane either uh, very, very, very suddenly, or you change your lane in unsafe, somebody was in your blind spot, stuff like that. So we classify this as aggressive lane change and so on. So we keep classifying these into different, different cases for driver behavior. Uh, this was used here in a hidden, hidden Markov model uh, I mean for this classification. Uh, and then what? Now, uh, the data set we used is the Strategic Highway Research Program 2 Naturalistic Driving Study uh, data set. It comes from Virginia Tech. For them to give us this data set, it took about six months of negotiation to give us the data set because they wanted to know what we are going to do with the data set, whether we're going to alter it or not, how private it's going to be, who's going to keep it. We have to get signatures from everybody that we are going to keep it safe and sound. We are not going to touch it. We are not going to expose it. We are not going to uh, share it with other people, all of this stuff. So they, they uh, but actually when it came, it had lots of stuff. It had uh, information about crash and crash situations of many, many, many drivers in many conditions. It had videos. Uh, of the situation, so many things can be analyzed with, it, with, with this data set. It's a very good data set for those who are interested. Of course, it costs money, they, they sell it, but it's, 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 it's worth it uh, in our case. And as I said before, this is where we look at crash and near situation and look at the, the risk a driver may, may, may be causing for this type of uh, crash. 
we also experimented with different machine learning models uh, like the previous speaker was talking about. There is random forest, there is support vector machines, there are uh, uh, other types of uh, uh, classification techniques, and at the end, uh, uh, our case showed that if we use random forest decision trees, then we are better off. It provides better classification of the cases we, we have, but this may apply to this data set. It may not be the case for other data sets. We don't know. Uh, so after we do this, so this is the offline part. We did All of this is offline. So now what do we do afterwards? Now we have drivers going. This is the online part where we actually measure the information. So what do we do with that? We have, remember we have, uh, uh, we did a classification and we have a vector that's, as, as said, these are the features for that particular driver. What we want to do is we want to have a risk prediction for this driver and then we have a probability of that. Once we have a probability of risk, we score drivers, and a better score is a higher score is better. We, so we, we with a score, and then we say your score is one, your score is two, and three, and so on. And for many insurance companies, this score would be good enough uh, to know what type of driver you are, and so on. And and what we want to do is what is the probability of 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 uh, uh, or, or, or sorry, what, what is the risk probability? of a certain driver, a certain environment, okay? And that's what we measure here. Uh, and at the end, that's what we end up with. So now we have a information about drivers. We, we know what the score of they have, and we also know how either skilled or unskilled they are, and whether they are aggressive, not aggressive, things like that. So what do we do afterwards? Uh, we go back to the system. What can we do with this? Remember the system that we collect this information about driver behavior and about road anomalies and road conditions inside the vehicle and with our smartphone. Same thing, now it feeds to this database here or whatever, but then we can go to the cloud where we can do cross-referencing between different vehicles. One of the things that we have done in the cross-referencing is not mentioned in this talk here, is that we can actually check whether the vehicle reporting its position is correct or not through checking vehicles in the surrounding areas. And then we know if these vehicles actually are in the same spot or not. But also the information provided. So if a vehicle reporting that this, this, this road segment has loss of potholes, for instance, but the other vehicles passing by the same road segment are not reporting that. So that's also something that we can check. Now once we do that, we... Um, the drivers could be the ones we use for the test case or others may want to make root queries. So we get back to them with route recommendation, but route recommendation mean will not be only the shortest or fastest route, but could be the route that could depend on other factors, including the road conditions and the nature of this driver. Who is asking for this route? Okay, is it is it is a driver? Uh, 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 is it is it John or or, or Jack or 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 whoever? Okay, so uh, this brings us now to route planning and route recommendation. So if I want to move from point A to point B, and 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 luckily in Kingston I only have two roads to choose from. Uh, 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 it's a small town, but even then you can see the differences between the road. So over here, for instance, I want to go from. Uh, uh, a place which is very close to Queen's University to a place which is close to uh, uh, the base or, or the military base or whatever, okay? Uh, so this is, this, is, this, is the, this is the route here. So the question is which route to use? This is the fastest route and this is another route. Usually Google will give you either, will give you this and will tell you that this is two minutes slower, this is three minutes slower, this is whatever, uh, extra minute addition, whatever. This is what Google will give you. And what, what we say is, can we provide Google with information to provide different routes? So, for instance, when we look at these uh, roads here, and I hope this works. So this is one of the roads, and this is uh, Queen Street. And as you can see even from the camera that the road is not very stable road, it's not a mild drive, it's not a smooth drive. This is the fastest route. So now we collect all of this information about the road, 
we see lots of potholes, lots of uh, 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 manholes that are not really smooth. The road itself is not smooth. So this is one, one possible route that we can, we can go through. Uh, the other is this one here, and, and this uh, goes uh, through a street called Princess Street, and this street is obviously much more smooth. This is the main street with lots of, this is uh, lots of the, the touristic street in town with lots of shops and so on that, and they want to keep it very smooth and, and nice for people to go through and so on. So you see that this is a much nicer road to be in if you want to keep your car and if, if you want to drive smoothly and so on. And also it's nice uh, scenery on both sides. So what do we do? We have the inputs. We see all the anomalies, the severity of these uh, uh, road conditions. Uh, and then we decide that the output of this is going to be that the route is poor, moderate, or good. These are three classifications of any road. So once we classify this, then we're going to say, OK, this part here of the road is poor. This is OK. This is poor. This is, poor, uh, this is OK. This is good. And this is OK. Actually, they are working on this part here. Uh, and the, this road is closed now. OK? So uh, now once we have that, then we say that, OK, route two is the one that, it, that can be recommended, for instance, because this is the route that is smoother and better and so on. But maybe we have different drivers. Maybe we have different drivers that don't actually only look at uh, okay, uh, no, uh, okay, uh, maybe I should go here. Not only look at the road conditions, but also at the skill of the driver and, and, and what this driver can do and things like that. So in this case, we may have the uh, driver risk profile or driver preferences uh, and the road conditions. So if I want to go from now point A here to point B in this case, then I may have different routes. And all of these routes will have different preferences for me. And the idea at the end is that we want to uh, recommend for Google something that, or for other uh, uh, navigation systems, something that they can use for that purpose. Okay. Uh, okay, so I would like to acknowledge uh, Abdullah and Amr, who are the ones that did most of the work about driver profiling and uh, on road information services uh, and dynamic route planning, and also my uh, colleague, Abu Magd Nouruddin, who did lots of work uh, and supervision with navigation systems and signal processing and all of the stuff uh, that is required there. And then I was on the project as well. And with that, uh, I thank you. Exactly. The phones are used as sensors and as computing devices and for sending the information as well. So we use the sensors on the phone, the sensors from the OBD, and we fuse the two readings to get a more accurate reading. So the, the OBD sensors are reporting to the phone? Reporting to the phone. So we have a dongle on the phone, that's a Bluetooth dongle on the phone right. that reports these, yes. And, and the point is, future vehicles will not need these sensors from the mobile. What we are using now, these, these are legacy vehicles that don't have all of this luxury of these new vehicles that have all of these sensors and all of these reporting and so on. So this is why we are uh, using both types of sensors. Uh, there is also um, another module here that I actually um, have not reported, which is what is the angle of the phone and whether it is sideways or it is this way, this way, in the pocket, whatever, there's another model that has to, that, that actually was taken care of as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask about when, when you have the GPS loss gaps, can you find the counters of an uh, anomaly? So how do you um, differentiate? 
So the, the, the I, INS um, um, sensors are going to give you some, uh, um, uh, I would say, uh, approximate location, so because they have errors, but they are going to begin where you last left them off. And also this can be used, we, we can actually use the maps to make sure that we are within the, the boundaries of, of the maps themselves. Yeah, yeah, and if the GPS outage is long, there's nothing you can do. So you are going to, uh, it's, 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 it's going to be, uh, uh, Yes, and that's what INS systems do because they have access to the speed, instantaneous speed, and so on, but still, they, they, they have deviation from, from the actual uh, values because these are not very accurate INS systems anyways. The ones, uh, if we go back, the ones that I have been talking about before, uh, which is, uh, if you go back to the set of equipment we have, Uh, there is one that is very accurate. This one here, and this is very expensive. But this one here uh, would work very well, even if there's a GPS outage, but this is a very expensive unit. Like, like, like we're talking about 25,000 or, or more. Yeah. No, no, no. We have not done that. This, this, is, this is just a, a simulated picture. Uh, we, that's what, what we want the student to work on that too. We, we don't want to overlay. We want to offer a pre-processing step for that. You mean this one here, right? So, so Google is going to, that's what Google is going to give you, okay? But we want Google to give you this instead. You can, you can, of course. Of course, you can do that, but if you use, but this one will have to use Google as well. If you use Google for a commercial purpose, you can't. If you use Google for a research purpose, that's fine. So we can do it in the lab for research purposes, and we can say, okay, here is an app that we developed. We can use for research purposes, and it, it works. Uh, or you can try to have an app that is approved by Google that can be used this way, yes. That's, that's another good point, yes, and we can, uh, so the question was uh, use open street maps, and this is, this is a point that was raised in our discussions, and I think it's an excellent point, and we may go for it. Yeah. Well, the answer is yes, uh, it can, because of, of, of the skidding that's going to happen, so through the, the different me measurements, we can, we can detect that, yes. Uh, I've heard that uh, you're also using a smartphone for, uh, for data collection transmission. So, you know, smartphone using, you know, uh, not just GPS, but also using Wi-Fi signals, cellular signals, or localization. So, but in your study, it seems that, uh, for that Joe referencing, you're only focusing on using GPS and then GPS plus INS, right? What about those uh, Wi-Fi signals that uh, Google has seen used very expensively? For location, uh, right. uh, we haven't, but that's, that's a very good point. Use landmarks or Wi-Fi signals for location? Absolutely, yes. It's, it's a very good point. Yes. And, and also, uh, again, on the use smartphones, there's something I missed, and maybe this question remind me of it. When you use a smartphone, the, what you transmit to the cloud doesn't have to be real time, which means that you can collect the information because information collection 
and then uh, uh, about roads does not have to be in real time. So we can accumulate certain collection about certain road, and when you are in Wi-Fi coverage, you can just send it. Because using the phone in, in a way that to send all this information will consume lots of the bandwidth that you have. So this is another point that I wanted to make. So the idea that we want is uh, if, if, if we can classify a driver to have a certain risky behavior, we want to warn that driver in real time. Okay, you are doing this. So the, the remainder, the remaining part of this, okay, we have the score of the driver, and we know that this driver behaves in this risky, has this risky behavior, so we want to warn that driver in real time. That's the idea. Uh, I, I, I don't know, but Google would have ways that you can enter this information, send information to it, and also ways will have also ways that you can enter um, um, road conditions or, or service on the road or whatever, like, like construction and things like that. But I am not aware that Google will have this as something being reported online, no. But they, I mean, there are many things that can be happening in the background that we don't know of, and then they suddenly announced, uh, and so on. Yeah. So the question is, for those who do not hear, the question is that what about the different sensor, either uh, uh, quality in terms of accuracy and also sensor calibration and things like that? Uh, the answer is absolutely true, and this is a problem. We have used actually two vehicles, not one, uh, but this, this, is, this is not enough. Two vehicles is not enough. Uh, and we... Uh, uh, one of the things that can be done is... Uh, because we have the sensors from the mobile phone, this helps. And also, the denoising also helps. The de denoising de de the, the signal such that it is, it is uh, more concentrated on the event that took place. Uh, but sensor calibration and, and, and accuracy and so on is certainly a factor. And this is a factor about the quality of information coming from any uh, uh, crowd sensing uh, application. Optimal learning module. Uh, you mean, uh, 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 yeah, you, you mean uh, uh, the, the way we, uh, actually I don't know whether this would, would apply to us or not, but yeah, I mean, I, uh, we can look into it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>